the value creation. Welcome to the Valuation Masterclass Case Study. This is where you'll learn about interesting stocks and how to value them. What's interesting about Crane is that 42% of its assets are not tangible. This is Andrew Stotts of the Valuation Masterclass. Let's get started. Remember, this video is for learning purposes only. It's not investment advice or recommendation. Crane is a diversified U.S. manufacturer of engineered industrial products serving aerospace process flow technologies and payment systems. Now, before I go more deeply into it, I want to look at the website of the company. So let's do that here. Whoops, let's do that. I'm going to go to the website and here's the website of the company. I just found it interesting. First of all, the company was started in 1855. So that means it's about 167 years old. And basically what's also interesting is that they try to do Kaizen and improvement events throughout the company. Also, what we can see is that here's they've got a great um, picture of the founder here, which we can see here. His name, of course, is Richard Teller Crane. He's the founder of Crane Company, and there he is right there. So I just find it, it's an interesting business. It's an old business. Let's look at it in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to go to the back to our PowerPoint. And first of all, the question is, will Crane's M&A strategy lead to further value creation? There's three things to know about this company. First, strategic M&A acquisitions to drive top line growth and divestiture helps to boost profitability over the long run and accelerated organic growth through higher government budgets. Now, to me, this is an interesting company and I'm just happy to see Haresh think the same thing. Haresh, it's good to see you. And yeah, this company is interesting. And one of the things that makes it interesting is that they do a lot of acquisitions. And what I've learned over the years is to be wary of companies that acquire because usually they mess it up and they don't get the synergies, they say. Now, there's 26 analysts covering this company. It's $125 as a target price by those analysts with an upside of 17% or a buy. The PE ratio is about 16 times and dividend yield is about 1.6. Now, my estimate right now is $92. That's a downside of 30, 13%, meaning it's a sell. I just don't see the value in the company right now. Let's go into more detail. First, the price remains bullish, but volume signals unclear. So over the past year, Crane has seen a strong bullish rally. The share price has increased by about 32%, a very good you know, uh, price rise. And the 50-day moving average line has stayed above the 200-day moving average throughout the whole period, which indicates it's been in a, it's been in a positive bullish trend. The RSI volume recently crossed the 50% 50, 50 line which if it continues could be a positive sign. Let's look at the revenue of this company. First of all, 43% of revenue comes from what's called payment and merchandising technologies. That's payment software, vending, and banking. These are products and services that they're providing to those industries. The next one is process flow technologies. And finally, aerospace and electronics, about 20%. Now, this is really a U.S. company. 63% of its revenue is the U.S. and 16% Europe. And then after that, we can see the U.K. and Canada. So not really exposure in Asia. Kyle, welcome to the show. Also, Kyle says acquisitions. Let's just look at what Kyle said here. I'm going to show it. Acquisitions are tough to manage in any industry. And the gross margins in the manufacturing industry are much lower than others. Not an easy, in, easy industry to make money in long term. Yeah, that's a good point. Now, what's interesting about this company is that it's been around for 167 years. So it has done something right. But I agree, it is very hard to see. So Kyle, and for the listeners out there, how do we measure if a company's acquisitions end up being good or not? I'm going to show you that in just a moment. So what's the story? Well, strategic M&A acquisitions are driving top line growth. We can see some of the acquisitions to the right. Over the past 10 years, Crane completed 13 significant acquisitions. 
The company plans to free up one to two billion dollars for M&A purposes through 2023. Besides boosting growth, acquisitions help to keep up with technological trends. Crane focused on acquisitions that could be directly merged with its existing entities, also called bolt-on transactions, and therefore synergies tended to show up pretty quickly. Now, also, you can see that goodwill compromises the majority of the asset. Here, I'm showing a line of uh, a chart that shows two lines on it. Goodwill is 35% of total assets. And we can see as of 2020, about 42% of total assets consisted of goodwill and intangible assets. Goodwill at 31 and intangibles at 11. And basically, its M&A activities are reflected in its asset base. The global average of industrial companies is goodwill of goodwill is about 8% and intangible is about six. So it's much higher. And that's where you can see that the objective of this company is buying other companies. Now, let's take a moment and try to answer the question. Is it generally good to have a lot of goodwill in your balance sheet? Goodwill is only allowed to be recognized when it is acquisition related. It is the excess purchase price paid above the fair value of net assets. Goodwill can include intellectual property or brand recognition. High goodwill could simply mean that the company overpaid or overestimated the future benefits of their acquisition. However, high goodwill can be justified for a high ROIC or return on invested capital business. So when evaluating goodwill, you want to do it in conjunction with ROIC. And so this is how we're going to go back and see the success of the acquisitions. Here, what I would say is that Crane delivered on its ROIC. Acquisitions seem to pay off. What I'm showing in this particular page is that in the past, Crane was able to generate an ROIC of around 20%, which is very strong. Only in 2020 did ROIC drop, and it went to about 11%, which is my estimate of the cost of capital for the company. So at no point, even during the crisis, did its value creation go negative. That's pretty impressive. And so therefore, Kyle, this is a good measure, ROIC, that we can see how well a company is acquiring. Now, I expect the company to be able to return to the 20% ROIC level in the near future. Crane might pay a high premium on its acquisitions, but synergies show. It claims that synergies turned out to be two times higher than analysts predicted. Now, it's one thing to look at a company's fundamental performance. It's another thing to look at the company's price. Sometimes it may not be worth it to buy. Now, what is the second story? The second story is divestiture helps to boost profitability over the long run. And I'm showing a table here of the four main parts of the business. Fluid handling, payment merchandise, aerospace, and engineering materials or engineered materials. But in the second quarter of 2021, Crane divested its engineered materials segment for about 360 million US dollars. Now, what's interesting about this divestiture is that the EBIT margin in 2016 was 19% for this business. So it's pretty good, but it collapsed all the way down to 11% recently. And that's part of the reason I suspect why they started to get out of it. Revenue contribution declined from 6% in 2020 from 10% in 2016. Profitability for this engineered materials has fallen by eight percentage points over the same period. Now, in its new strategic alignment, the company aims to focus on its three core competencies. And it is using divestiture-related funds to expand its highly profitable aerospace business, using those funds to invest in other areas. So, number three story is accelerated organic growth through higher government budgets. Now, if your business depends on the U.S. government defense budget, you're pretty lucky because it tends to go up almost every single year. Congress just never stops giving money to the U.S. military. The aerospace and defense segment is likely to see strong organic growth, and the primary drivers are a rebound in commercial airline industry and increases in the U.S. defense budget. This segment plays a critical role in realizing future growth and enhancing profitability. Aerospace EBIT margin of 20.5% 20 
versus the, com the company's total margin of 15.6 tells us that aerospace is very profitable. Industry growth is about 7 to 8% CAGR until 2030. That's what's being expected. Now, remember, you can scan the barcode that you've got here or click the link below the episode and go to valuationmasterclass.com. That go that'll take you to the blog. Go to the blog to download all the free case study reports that we have up there. So, also, let's look at the company based upon its FVMR scorecard. It measures a stock's attractiveness relative to all other companies. Attractiveness is based on four elements: fundamentals, valuation, momentum, and risk. And it's on a scale from one best to ten worst. So here we can see that the company is kind of neutral all the way around. And let's look at momentum just a bit. And what we can see is that in the past 12 months, we've got positive revenue momentum and positive earnings momentum. And price change has been a little bit negative by just a bit. So momentum is starting to return in the area of revenue and EPS growth. Now, recently I created a short online course explaining my FEMR investing approach. You can get this $97 course for free just by scanning the code that I show there or clicking on the link that I have below. Now let's talk about the forecast. Consensus still sees upside after a recent price rally. There's seven analysts covering the company. The upside is 17%. Four analysts expect the company to outperform while three analysts still stay cautious. I have to apologize. I think at the beginning I said that there was more than seven analysts, but there's only seven. Now, analysts expect a strong margin expansion in line with the company's strategy to focus on its highly profitable segments. We can see gross margin going up to 38.1 in 2021, then 38, then 39 in 2023. Let's look at the P&L for a moment, the profit and loss. We can see that net profit sees a strong rebound in 2021, and that could lead to a record, right? The strong bottom line is driven mainly by the margin expansion, but also strong growth prospects. What about the balance sheet? This is probably the most interesting slide in the whole presentation. Here you can see that Goodwill is the primary asset on the company's balance sheet. Let's just look at the year of 2020. We can see that Goodwill accounted for $1.4 billion, whereas the total assets of the balance sheet were about 4.6. So a very significant chunk comes from goodwill. Given its past M&A history and relevance for growth generation, I'm going to assume further acquisitions to take place over the next years. And so I'm going to forecast that goodwill to grow. Now, what about the liability side of the balance sheet? The company recently agreed on resuming its share repurchase program. And we can see that uh, that is causing the, uh, it's a negative line item in the, balance sheet in the equity section. And that causes the return on equity to rise because equity is falling. The total confirmed budget of $300 million is spread over the following years. Now, let's look at ratios. Asset base shrunk. We can see in 2021, it was basically down about minus uh, point z uh, 0 0.6. So this is due to divestiture that we mentioned before. Beyond 2022, I see a strong asset growth and providing the basis for revenue to grow in a similar direction. So what about margin and return on assets? The margin expansion is also reflected in higher return on assets, which is likely to double in 2021. We can see that return on assets have gone from three to four, ending up at four in 2020, and now it's up to nine 0.6, 9.7 in 2021 and 2022. So a strong recovery there. Now let's get into the valuation of this company. First, let's talk about the long-term share price potential. Could this company share price double, triple, quadruple, go up five times? Let's answer that question by looking at earnings and price. First, if we want to look at earnings, we want to look at revenue and that's price times quantity. Now, in the case of price, the potential for price to rise is moderate. The ability to raise prices for specialized niche technology seems to be there. The quantity is good. Strong organic and inorganic M&A growth is expected. 
we know also that M&A growth is lumpy because they're investing in a lumpy way. In other words, huge investments sometimes and none some years. The cost of goods sold, well, there's a moderate potential there. Higher growth in aerospace could spice up the margin further. And OPEX is weak, weak potential for earnings growth impacting it positively. Market is already anticipating a strong margin expansion. So EPS could achieve high single digit growth from 2021 through to 2025. Now let's look at price. The potential in relation to the PE looks weak. Although it's cheap on a uh, PE basis at about 13 times, EPS growth is slower than the industry average. On a price to book basis, it also, it's, it's a little bit more moderate because basically the price to book is 2.9, which is a lot less than that five times or so for the industry. And ROE is about in line. So I would say there is some potential for this company. So the share price seems to be fair based upon its multiples and maybe a little bit of potential there. Now let's look at the free cash flow. We can see it's very stable and strong free cash flow. So now let's get into the valuation estimate. I see a slight high, slightly higher revenue growth than consensus. Consensus is saying 6.5. I'm going to say about 7. Despite acknowledging the recent margin expansion, it will be difficult, in my opinion, for Crane to maintain that growth forever. Aerospace and defense segments become increasingly competitive. My long-term assumptions are relatively optimistic with regards to maintaining high profitability. So I'm going to use the free cash flow method. You can use some of the parts and other methods, but for right now, let's use free cash flow. And I've got a weighted average cost of capital of 11%. That's probably the biggest risk to my assumptions is that someone may say, well, you could probably bring down your weighted average cost of capital, but also keep in mind that I have a very relatively high terminal growth rate of 4%. So my base case valuation is $92. That's a 13% downside. My bull case can get me to a 6% downside, and my bear case has got me at a 20% downside. Just don't see the upside of this company right now. Let's look at the world-class benchmarking scorecard of the company, which identifies a company's competitive position relative to global peers. We use a composite rank of profitability and growth. We call it profitable growth, and a scale from one best to 10 worst. So the company is ranked number two on profitable growth in the past 12 months. That's benchmarked against 1,480 large industrial companies worldwide. I'd say that's pretty darn good. From a profitability perspective, this company is doing very well. And where is that profitability coming from or the profitable growth? It's coming from profitability. This is the return on assets. And that profitability has maintained a world-class level at about two over the years and in the past 12 months. In 2020, that profitability went down a bit, but then it came back up in the past 12 months. Growth has been kind of a moderate driver, not a particularly strong driver. Profitability is the key to driving the company's profitable growth. So what are the risks? Well, the risk of overpaying for acquisitions, impairment charges, or failure to integrate businesses, the inability to protect intellectual property or lacking innovative ideas and just having to buy other companies, and adverse regulatory changes and environmental liabilities. So Crane, in this case, the three things to know is strategic M&A acquisitions to drive up the top line growth. Divestiture helps to boost profitability over the long run and accelerated organic growth through higher government budgets. The conclusion, strong ability to grow organically and through strategic acquisitions. Focus on profitable segments could bring ROIC back to 20%. But the stock trades kind of in line with industry multiples. And I would say, I don't see a huge upside in it. So my question is, let's go back to that question. Will Crane's M&A strategy lead to further value creation? That is the, cre the, the question. It's great to see you all. Kyle, Haresh, also Hillary and Lee. I appreciate all you guys here and others.